Good morning and welcome to the University of Salamanca. First of all, I will welcome our uh, Deputy of uh, uh, Regional uh, Deputy Minister of uh, Min uh, Universities and Research, Professor Pilar Garcés. Thank you for being here, and also the General Coordinator of uh, ACTU, Dear Ludovic, and give the word to Professor Efrem Gildif to introduce the speeches. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Director. It's a pleasure to, to introduce our uh, special guests. More than guests, uh, they are part of the project uh, somehow and directly. So before uh, giving the word to our coordinator, general coordinator, uh, uh, Professor Ludovic Tilly, uh, you know him, most of you, uh, because of his hard uh, work and uh, insistence on achieving the goals we are looking for. So uh, Ludovic, please, the role is yours. Yeah, thank you. Uh, dear Rector, dear Ricardo, uh, dear uh, Deputy Minister, uh, dear Pilar, dear Ephraim, uh, dear colleagues, it's uh, a real honor to, to be here in Salamanca again. This is, uh, the, I think, the fourth time that I'm here, and in particular in this room. I remember um, a few years ago we had the celebration of the 800th year anniversary of uh, Salamanca uh, University with the Magna Carta. Uh, signatures. Uh, it was a very memorable uh, moment uh, when we also discussed about values of the academic world and I think in a way uh, this is uh, connected to what we are doing uh, here all together. Um, I will not actually say too much yet on the EC2 Alliance because a bit later this morning uh, I will make a, a general presentation of the EC2 Alliance. So uh, I will not spend too much time on this, but I would really like to say that uh, we all arrived here um, on Tuesday, so we've been already working very hard. It was mostly closed meetings uh, until today, uh, where we uh, revised the work plan, we looked at how we are making progress, and I'm very happy uh, to, to say that uh, we are soon going to celebrate the first uh, 12 months, one year of the EC2 Alliance, and we have actually already achieved a lot, uh, more than what we could expect, I must say. There have been challenges, but we are finding solutions. Uh, and um, we clearly show that this initiative that was launched by the European Commission is really making... Uh, a step forward in what we can achieve in the higher education system. Uh, and in particular, the Alliance is more than the sum of its individual components, which means that we are creating a real community. A bit earlier this morning, we had uh, the plenary council where we had our 30 associated partners, the municipalities, the students associations, some regional governments, uh, some chambers of commerce, science parks, etc. 30 associated partners. And we also see that we are starting to cooperate with them, but they also start to make cooperation among themselves, which means that clearly EC2U is going to be not only a consortium of universities, but a consortium of all actors from the knowledge square, which is education, research, innovation, and service to society. Uh, so, so really, this is why I'm so happy to be here. First, because this is the first time we have a face-to-face -face hybrid, actually, meeting. We have been working hard only via WebEx and Zoom meetings. We have actually achieved already a lot, but we clearly understand that it is when we meet in the same room that we can make even more progress. So, which means that we will probably be even more proactive in the next two years, which is a good sign. So that's the first reason. The second reason is because indeed, uh, we need to uh, see each other, we need to uh, show that we are uh, helping uh, the higher education system to make progress. Uh, and the presence of the Deputy Minister uh, uh, here is a sign indeed of uh, 
the importance of such initiative. So it's a real pleasure to be here at this public forum. Uh, the colleagues online and the, the citizens can follow it on the Salamanca web TV. This is absolutely fantastic. Uh, and again, I'm very looking forward to uh, the next two days for the interaction with all of you. Thank you. Tilly. He is not only enthusiastic, but he is insistent. So uh, we are in good hands in that sense. And now uh, I have the honor to give uh, the role to our Deputy Minister of Universities and Research. Uh, you know, uh, Professor Pilar is not just uh, part of EC2U, she is. Uh, and when I ask her to, to participate as associated partner, from the regional uh, government, she immediately said, Ephraim, we are in. And this, this is why we are very happy having you here. And thank you for coming. I know your, your commitments are huge, but you have just booked some short time for us. And this is why we are happy. And I'm giving the role to you now. Thank you for coming. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Ephraim, for having invited me to stay here with you, to share with you uh, all that uh, your work is doing. And uh, I can see that uh, from the uh, coordinator, you are doing an excellent job uh, with all the meetings. Uh, I can see that it's uh, week number three. The other two were a little bit, as you said, bidimensional. Now we are in a, uh, in, instead of face-to-face, mask-to-mask situation. Uh, but it, it's, it's quite nice. Thank you very much, uh, Rector, because uh, it's, it's, it's always a pleasure and a privilege for me to be here in the University of Salamanca. As you know, in Castilla León, we've got four public universities, but obviously Salamanca is our dear university, not because it's more the, let's say, I don't want to say it's the oldest one, but it's probably the, the one that was born before uh, and, and has got lots of tradition, but at the same time, it merges with the future in advanced technology and obviously uh, foreseeing what is, uh, what is to come. And that's uh, here you are in order to, to see all that. Uh, because I'm going to be speaking later, uh, I don't really want to make uh, any particular point on, on a specific aspects because we're going to see it a little bit later. But um, something that is very important is that for me, the European Alliance, the campus, are going to be the cornerstone of the nature and essence of Europe. Because now we are living in turmoil times. We know that uh, things are very relative Nothing's stable, right? Uh, but uh, someone said that the, the, the constants, no, the, the, the constants of a weathercock is to change, uh, which is, is a contradiction in terms. But at the same time, it's something important for us because we have to maintain certain aspects. Europe is somewhere in the world. We have to be somewhere in the world because here, uh, freedom, democracy, everything that was good for people, for human beings, was born. And I think we have to claim that. Yeah? And, and we have to be, even though we live in terrible times, as I said, we need to be uh, together, strong, and I think this kind of alliances in Europe, we have to be the beam of society, being universities and these centers of knowledge. So thank you very much for all your efforts. Thank you very much for coming here. Thank you very much for opening your city because as the uh, name of this uh, alliance says, easy to you, we can play on words, it's easy to you, um, easy for you to come with me, to, to be with you, right? So you can play with words there, that, let's uh, change a little bit, easy to you, because it's something that is European and it's going to be something nice to be working on. Now, this morning, when we were taking the pictures, everyone said, we have to say easy to you, and I was going to say, say the longest word we've got in, uh, in, for human beings, which is smile, and smile always. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, dear Deputy Minister and friend uh, Pilar. We know that, uh, you know, playing with the words, with the etymologies, with the semantics is somehow uh, excellent. I think this is the best part of what the human being can really express in such circumstances. We are using the word in order to transmit ideas, convictions, 
and projects, this is the ECTU. And this is why we are happy in this sense also using the words. And now I'm going to give the role to our rector. First of all, thanking him for his unconditional support uh, for the whole time that we have been working on the project and then launching it and then putting in practice all the activities we are now talking about and we are uh, starting to work on. Uh, I'm thankful to you uh, and the group of ECTU, USAL, has been highly supported. He has been even signing uh, things sometimes uh, without uh, being so convinced, but he, as he as knew that we were going to, good, to do a good job, he just said, go forward, uh, I'm with you, and I'm thankful to you also to be here now for the opening uh, day, and now you have the role. Thank you very much, Efrem, for your effort and work with your team, and thank you very much also, Pilar. It's so easy, thanks to you and the support of the regional government, and always thank you to Ludovic also. Welcome, colleagues, dear colleagues. Uh, I would like to warmly welcome you to this, to the University of Salamanca, to the third SCTU Alliance Forum. We can finally meet face to face or mask to mask after a long period of social distancing due to the pandemic, we are so happy to have you here. I'm sure that this meeting will help us to strengthen the bonds that unite us and the commitment that we have acquired with the creation of this SCTU macro project. Our Alliance project does not only cover the three fundamental pillars of innovation, research, and education that are crucial for any institution of higher education. It is also closely related to three fundamental United Nations uh, development goals, uh, health and well-being, quality education, and sustainable cities and communities. Despite the pandemic, we have been able to continue and implement the activities of the ECTU project, thanks to Ludovic, to Ephraim, all the team. Thank you very much for this effort. And we are already achieving the first result from the colossal effort made by the different governing groups of our alliance. Uh, this pilot project give us the opportunity to pull our strengths and objectives to fight for a real European higher education system. The education system we are building together will undoubtedly contribute to creating a more cohesive and better educated uh, Europe. If we gather our efforts to try in the present and future European generations, we will succeed in building the Europe of our dreams, the foundation of which is an educated society, a defender of freedom and academic autonomy. Education is our strength and our alliance in taking the first steps towards a multilateral cooperation that can only enrich our higher education system. In this context, the University of Salamanca actively participates in the ECTU Alliance with all the means at its disposal. At the moment, we have already taken the first steps towards our final goals. We have already created and will now implement the official European master's degree in European languages, cultures, and societies in contact at our seven member universities. This master's degree will be unique in Europe because of its a la carte structure. The master program is a very key model in terms of study structure. A student starting with a master here in Salamanca can get up to four official degrees in four different countries studying in up uh, to four different languages. We believe that this type of innovative master's degree, not yet implemented in Europe, is the future. The University of Salamanca leads one of the three CTU virtual institutes, the Virtual Research Institute in Quality Education, which has a pilot project profiling language and cultural diversity. In this respect, macro research groups are being now created and will commonly develop European research and innovation projects. 
The other six universities involved in the project contribute as much as the University of Salamanca to developing a large list of joint initiatives like common joint masters and multilateral research and mobility activities. All this work is exactly what Europe as a whole is looking for, a solid and exemplary higher education system. But we will not only have an impact in Europe, we are determined to transfer our SCTU higher education experience to countries outside the European Union, particularly those that now are building the Euro-Ibero-American higher education area. Our alliance will be a reference here. On behalf of all the rectors of the seven partner universities, we thank you for the work and the results achieved by the members of the SCTU family. You have done an exceptional job and achieved unique results. Together, we will make it possible for the new academic generation to be educated as the European continent desires. Quality in research, innovation, inclusion, and international mobility is closer and closer to the desired dream, a free, well-educated and cohesive European society. In these few intensive days, the ECTU community will work, debate, and be productive. We have conference, roundtables, and collaborations of external partners. I'm sure that we'll achieve very positive results, which will allow us to continue fighting for the academic vocation of the seven universities involved in the Alliance. Welcome and enjoy Salamanca, this wonderful city, a city that understands itself in the context of this uh, old university. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, dear rector, for these warm words and encouraging uh, the whole groups with the different um, working uh, with him and on the different activities. And now uh, uh, this is uh, the, the time where we have opened the, the let's say, the session uh, next now next uh, part of uh, of today will be a wonderful a nice uh, conference on behalf of our deputy minister. Uh, I don't know how we are going now to, uh, shall we wait a bit or shall we start immediately? Te pones ahí o aquí? No, pero mejor aquí, yo creo, sí. Well, uh, as you know, uh, the rectors are slaves of their agenda, so he has to leave us and uh, if I may, I will make, I will continue with my role as the presenter. Uh, I'm going to probably, or you, mejor que te vayas, si. Ah, lo vamos a dar a ellos entonces. Después. Ya lo tienes, esto lo se ha dado. No, no, no se lo he dado todavía. No. Sí, bien. Sí, bien. Si quieres ponte en medio así te acompaño ahí mejor, ¿no? O... Sí, mujer. Well, you know, once the rector is outside, I feel now I can talk a bit. <laughs> uh, now, don't don't just, forget, this is uh, online too. Huh? I know, I know, but it's also good to, to have the, it. I know. The, the, I whole, have the, the whole world is watching us. Be careful. Behave. You know, we, will, we will do it even better. So, uh, allow me to introduce you again our Deputy Minister and uh, Professor uh, Pilar Garces, who is not just, uh, now we know her um, from her duties uh, within our regional government, but uh, as I know her for a long time, I would love to just underline some short 
let's say, uh, points related to her career as a professor, as responsible of the university, and also as, uh, of course, uh, deputy minister uh, at the regional level. Uh, allow me to just highlight some, some points. Uh, Professor Pilar Garces, deputy minister, has been for a long period uh, working as vice rector for international relations at the University of uh, Valladolid, which is, let's say, a, a sister university of Salamanca, uh, which is located in, in Castilla Leon. And her experience in that sense is uh, honestly uh, very high and very rich. She was also, uh, before she became vice deputy uh, or at the regional level, she was also the director for the universities. And it's there where, where we, we shared uh, nice experiences, not only at the local level, but at the international level. As she's always active, uh, she tries to push uh, for those projects that are not only attractive, but also very useful. Indeed, uh, she has been uh, the director also for, uh, or manager, I don't know whether director is the right, right word, uh, for twinning project uh, in, uh, with Morocco, where we have even somehow uh, taken to Morocco the, our ECT, uh, ECT uh, credit system. European credit transfer system, which is probably going to be applied uh, in the future in those regions where uh, a common system is needed. But at the same time also, uh, as she is very active, a um, few years ago, uh, we decided to put in common also another project where she was, let's say, uh, the, the uh, how would I say, uh, the pushing uh, and encouraging person for a common project where uh, the four public universities were going to promote the Spanish language uh, in the United States. And we achieved some results, but due to the pandemic, everything have, has been stopped. So, uh, we, but we are sure that we are going to, to start with it again. And you know, as I told you, uh, we are happy having a, a, a deputy minister with such initiatives, activities, intensive work. And I'm not going to take uh, much more time. I could talk the whole morning about, about her qualities, but I think she will delight us with that topic about uh, multilingualism, which is a very and needed uh, topic uh, today. Because whether we want or not, Europe is a multilingual society, multicultural society that somehow needs to have a balanced way to, in order to appreciate this diversity, uh, this encouraging multicultural uh, daily life that today, in my opinion, is much more than needed. So thank you for coming, uh, Pilar, and I'm going to give you the role. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Efren. Uh, well, thank you for staying here. I'm going to say uh, hello as well for the, all the people who are following us uh, through the screen, uh, and welcome to uh, this um, seminary uh, or, or this uh, talk in which we are going to discuss a little bit what is the role of languages uh, in the international arena, right? Not, not, not only institutions, uh, but in the international arena. And let me, uh, I, I've been thinking about that quite a lot. Uh, and um, because one thing I have to say is that although now I am working in politics, I am a professor. That's my essence. And that's something I cannot forget, and I will never forget. And that is something that has helped me go through politics as well. There's something that we have to say that. And a reflection that um, normally I, I used to, to entail is that, so entertain, is that um, uh, here uh, there's a group of people also following us from different screens, uh, seven different cities, but maybe uh, 
lots and lots of languages that people speak. Uh, we are speaking the lingua franca, English, because that's the, the language in which we can understand each other in, in a way that uh, it was Latin in the Renaissance. No, not exactly the same, because uh, Latin was not a, 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 a language spoken in any particular country, while English is spoken in geographically in particular countries as first language. So it's not exactly the same, but the lingua franca uh, English allows us right, to understand each other with a minimum effort, which is something that obviously we all have as an aim and objective. But let me give you an example. When I am with you, with European um, colleagues from university, students, um, workers for the university, I feel at home. I feel at ease. I feel understood. While when I am sometimes in my political issues and everybody speaks Spanish, I feel a foreigner. And nobody understands me. Right? So what is the role of languages then? Right? Because sometimes you speak the same language and you feel completely isolated, completely an alien. And when you speak different languages, and even when you try to speak other languages that you're not familiar with, you, sp you feel mo much more at home. Right? So let's, say, let, let's break a little bit this topic that uh, languages are something that are a barrier. Languages are not, are not a barrier. We have to actually try and destroy that barrier. And that is one of the objectives, I guess, of this alliance, right? To make this, uh, uh, of, of course, a barrier. And another thing that we have to, to see in Europe, and it's so rich, is that in, sometimes we've got expressions in different languages, right? For example, when, when we are at ease and, and we are um, having a great time, we use the expression, Italian expression, <coughs> uh, il dolce far niente. Uh, so it, it's, it's important. Or, or when we use, we, we use in French, c'est la vie, <coughs> right? But there, uh, laissez faire, laissez passer. Uh, uh, so that we, we use so many, so many expressions in different languages because we have a common stem, a common root that we should not forget, right? Also having, of course, sometimes uh, Latin as well as, as uh, uh, I don't know whether I can, or next one, no, or, no, ah, no, okay. Now, uh, the promotion of multilingualism. Now, in this case, we've got uh, a cartoon saying, a foreign language is tough enough without having to learn di dialects, right? So we've got here, um, what happens here with the promotion of multilingualism? I think multilingualism is a key question, right, in Europe, in order sometimes to overcome also some, some problems that we, ha we might, might have with other co-official languages in our countries, right, or uh, dialects in that sense, right? Why? Because we have to promote, obviously, both both languages, or, or both uh, parts of, of the language. On one hand, we have to promote all the different languages that are official in Europe that are, are being spoken. And each country, of course, they have to promote their own languages or dialects in order to be able to speak with a different community. But this is not an opposition. That is richness. And we have to overcome that richness by especially uh, uh, teaching the, 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 the strength of having this kind of multilingual communities. So language, we should take away this, uh, or, or, or die, do away with this idea of languages being always a barrier. It takes an effort to learn languages, yes, it takes an effort. But everything takes an effort. If we have to study maths, it takes an effort. If we have to study physics, it takes an effort. If we have to study sustainability, how to make the, the planet sustainable, it makes an effort. Everything makes, takes an effort, but it's worthwhile. And that is something that we really have to see. So the, uh, the, the European Council is promoting multilingualism and, and is actually encouraging all of us to, uh, to exactly to, to, to see uh, or, or to continue uh, being uh, with, with, with this uh, aspect. Let me, uh, let, let me just go a little bit. Uh, I don't know if, if I talk from there, will, will you li listen to me? No. no. <laughs> oh, okay, because I can't see very well, but maybe you can see much better what I'm, but this uh, uh, multilingualism, the, the European Council uh, uh, actually uh, was promoting, right? Now, uh, and in the next one, right. 
Why is multilingualism so important, right? Well, uh, as you can see, there are several aspects. Uh, and uh, let's see if I can see from my, sorry about that, from my iPad, because I've got glasses and, and uh, I can't see very well uh, the, uh, okay. Uh, why is multilingualism so important? Well, multilingualism is very important because it takes us into different <coughs> cultures. It opens our minds, and obviously it makes us understand much better. I read a sentence from uh, an Indian writer, very, very, uh, was quite famous from, uh, by his novel, August. Uh, he, he's called Upamanyu Chatterjee. And he said something quite striking. He said, the more languages you speak, the less likelihood you have to become a terrorist. <laughs> which is something that makes us think, right, how languages actually makes us, opens a window to look at a world. It makes us think that there are other ideas that we can contrast, that we can contribute, right, with. And it takes us away from our own selves. So this idea, this is a very strong uh, sentence, but he experienced it himself being uh, also being brought bilingual in his native language in India and in English because he was then taken to England. So that is something uh, uh, really important that uh, we have to take, uh, uh, to take in, in mind, right? Uh, then, what is the motto of, uh, of, uh, of, of Europe? United in diversity, right? That is the motto. So it means that we really have to appreciate diversity. It's not us against the others. It's all of us together. Now, if we talk about pragmatics uh, in, in linguistics, why do we always say that me and you are opponents? That you and me, or you and we, we are different. And when we make the difference, normally it's to, make this, to say that we are better than you. Right? So we have to avoid that because Europe had a specific aim, which was be united in diversity. Now, it's important to see that because uh, the, uh, the phrase uh, is taken from Ernesto Teodoro Moneta, who was uh, an Italian, uh, uh, an Italian um, uh, who received the, uh, Nobel, uh, uh, the, prize, no, the Nobel Prize for Peace in 1908, right? And he was the one who was promoting that in uh, the motto in Latin, saying united in diversity. And that is something we have to continue doing in Europe because being that the motto is that where we have to, uh, to get to. Now, uh, what, is the, uh, what, what is the European Union doing to promote multilingualism? We're going to see the positive side. Obviously, we have to motivate. As in the cartoon, when he say, I selected Spanish uh, uh, so that you can get your allowance. No? So uh, we need to motivate our students to learn languages. If we don't motivate them, of course, they are not going to learn any language whatsoever. But we have to motivate them somehow, right? So uh, Europe is doing a lot in, in, in multilingualism because, of course, it's promoting the, the, the use of different languages, the study of different languages, and uh, is promoting, obviously, with the Erasmus program, is one of the best programs, I think, that Europe has ever had in order to promote not only languages, but this idea of sharing culture, of sharing ideas, of sharing concepts, and of making us uh, know each other, right? Now, there are lots of families that we know that grew up from the Erasmus program. Uh, there are uh, lots of couples uh, that live in different countries, that speak two or three languages, uh, because they met in this, in this program. I think this program was one of the most successful programs of Europe, and we really have to continue promoting it. So, it is true that now, sometimes, uh, uh, but the Commission, right, um, as I said, is responding to this promotion of multilingualism by doing what? Well, in the first, in the first place, is taking actions recommended in the, in the Council recommendation on a comprehensive approach to the teaching of learning of languages. This includes working with member states and leading experts in language education to modernize language teaching and to make it more efficient. That's something we have to do. We have to make the learning of languages more efficient and more up to 
date to what we have uh, during uh, what we have here and what we are going to have in the future. Now, at the same time, it strengthens its drives for evidence-based policy making, rendering EU legislation more effective in providing public goods such as a cohesive and multilingual society. So the EU is doing quite a lot uh, when, when talking about that. But of course, as we need, we need innovation in language teaching, right? Now, uh, we have to award the European language label to citizens and projects fostering the development of innovative language teaching techniques. That is important. And I'm saying that because even though Europe is doing a lot uh, for the promotion of languages, uh, for uh, taking innovation in language teaching, it's got also sometimes not such a positive, uh, or, uh, sorry, uh, a positive uh, aspect. Uh, but let's see, what happened with languages? Okay, languages, as Graham, Graham Greene said, that we are born men, but we have the duty of becoming a human being. And how do we become a human being? We become a human being by our relationship with others. So men, men as we said, become <coughs> human beings with relation with others. What happens when communication fails, right? That's something we have to see what happens with communication fails and, 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 and what is important to do. Well, in this case, we've got that European universities are in need of help. What is help? Help is higher education language policy. Because <laughs> our languages in, in, in our languages in jeopardy. Well, um, according to uh, the European Journal of Language Policy, right? Uh, we really need some help because the higher education system needs to improve their strategy development and capacity for change and also increase their quality culture. It's very important, of course, to work together with the European Association for Quality Assurance in Higher Education. Obviously, that also has to go hand in hand. But why are we crying? Why are we needing uh, this type of help? Well, because sometimes there is a contradiction, and that is very human, uh, between what is said is needed and what is done to promote it. Now, uh, sometimes language, uh, uh, and in this case I'm talking about the language experts, language professors, language teachers, uh, they say that sometimes uh, there has been very good work in research for languages and innovative surveys, but that have no impact or, or follow-up from, uh, let's say, from maybe from policymakers. So uh, one thing that I was trying to do as a deputy minister for, for regional deputy minister for universal research was trying to work with researchers. In which way? Well, for me, the results of projects, they have to do, they have to be a benefit for society. It's not something that we are writing about in a journal, uh, in a specific uh, uh, scientific review, but then that doesn't go to society. So as decision policy decision maker, I, in one of my projects in, in, that I was working with in, in, uh, in uh, Erasmus uh, Key Action 3, uh, we tried to work with some researchers and see to find out what is the benefit, for example, of virtual exchange programs, right? What is the benefit? And when I had to draw uh, some kind of decrees or, or have to draw policies on, um, on digital uh, use or on digital tools for schools, I used the, res the, the, the results of the researchers because that's very important. So what we need to do is to make these results of researchers, uh, we, may, we have to make them uh, be, or, or we have to make them easy to access, or we have to send them to policymakers so that they can use them um, in the benefit of society. Because sometimes the, 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 we, we make policies without having enough argument to draw the, the specific policy. So sometimes when I talk to these, uh, to these specialists, they say, uh, what is the impact in policy makers, right? All, all this effort that we put into teaching languages, into making innovation, what is, what is the effect? And 
uh, in, in Europe, there has been also positive and not so positive on, or let's say different ideas on uh, this uh, multilingualism. Now, uh, when I started using uh, the, research, the, the results of researchers, uh, I, I talked to Andrula Vasiliu, who was the commissioner for multilingualism. There was a specific commissioner for multilingualism. But nowadays, when I was going to talk to the commissioner of multilingualism, they said there is no such a commissioner. It has been merged into uh, the sorry, thank you. It has been merged into the uh, commissioner of um, uh, innovation, research, culture, education, and youth. For me, that's a pity, because we need someone specifically to work for multilingualism. And uh, from 2014, we don't have a commission specific for that. It has been merged into that. So I think that uh, basically it's very important to continue working with the different, uh, the different aspects of, 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 uh, of multilingualism. And at the same time, when we when European Union launches conferences, for, for example, there was an April conference in 2021, uh, it's a conference on the future of Europe. Uh, what, the only response they, they, they received from European citizens was a, a, a retired person who said, I would like the EU countries to agree and ensure that in each country there are always free and easily accessible toilet facilities. Right? Because when we are traveling around Europe, we don't know where uh, to go and, and use the toilet. It is a pity that all these different efforts that the European Union is, is doing uh, doesn't go to, uh, to the different uh, places where it, it should go. Now, uh, what is the power of languages? Well, the power of languages is great, it's big. And uh, as you can read from here, uh, I took uh, one, uh, one uh, sentence or, or one phrase from Nelson Mandela, who said, talk to a man in a language and he will go to his head or her head, but talk to him in, a la in his language or her language and he will go to the heart. And that's very important. We have to think about that. The language, uh, the power of languages is really important. To make an effort in teaching, learning some languages, even if they are not very perfect, right, then it, it's, it's always worthwhile to use it. And I think that promoting, uh, promoting multilingualism is taking people away from their comfort zone. Of course it is, but it's widening their expectations. And that is something that we really have to do and to continue doing. Now, the world needs communication. Because if we have these thermal uh, times, it's because we don't have commun enough communication. Communication means to listen, to understand, to think over something, and then to respond, obviously. Because we have loads of uh, digital tools in order to have information. But information is not only communication. We have said that many times. But we need to communicate. So the world is in desperate need of communication. And this type of alliances is going to be one of the key aspects to ensure and to ease the way for communication. Now, another sentence I really liked from, uh, from someone that uh, I was reading was that language is the means of getting an idea from my brain into yours without surgery. That is important, that is important, and that is what you are doing here, all of you and all of us, trying to, uh, to promote communication, to promote multilingualism, and to promote the use of language to communicate. Now, this is basically the end of what I wanted to do. As, as I knew, uh, you were in, in, in different, uh, in different, um, in different <laughs> cities with different languages, I just wanted to say thank you in all the different languages. Uh, you have to excuse me because I could uh, say uh, uh, thank you very much. I could say vielen Dank. I could say uh, grazie. I could say uh, merci beaucoup. Uh, um, uh, I could say kitos. Uh, the only one that was a bit difficult for me was uh, to pronounce uh, the Romanian thank you. But uh, uh, I think you, you could see it uh, from there. Thank you very much. 
Eh, muchas gracias and, and welcome to the University of Salamanca. And I hope and I know, I'm sure, that the experience you share are going to be very important. In fact, I'm going to, to follow all your different workshops. I'm going to ask probably for, for to, to, to watch some of your, uh, of your workshops so that I can have ideas to take to my own department and see if we can work with that. Thank you very much for bearing with me today and uh, have a great day. Uh, well, not great days, because you're going to be here for, for some days. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Minister Dear Pilar. As you know, uh, she is not only an excellent communicator, but she knows what she's talking about. And this is one, in my opinion, one of the main important issues. Such critical and needed topics that uh, need to be well understood, because uh, sometimes we consider multilingualism like, well, if you know many languages, it's OK. If not, who cares? And as uh, Professor Garces has underlined, through the language, you arrive to the heart. Through the language, you are able to see according to the view of the one whom you are talking to, to understand him and to follow him, what he means and what you want to communicate with him or her. And I think this is the best way. Language is the best mean, but it can also become uh, a dangerous uh, mean in order to destroy. Those societies that have not experienced such a multilingualism as Europe is doing, uh, have gone through uh, very complicated situations, wars, uh, invasions, and so on. And the language is the mean where we can understand each other, but not just, just at a superficial level, as Pilar has uh, underlined. We have to, to learn how they think, how they reason, in order to enrich each other, in order to understand it, each other. And this is the unique way where Europe can feel really strong. Don't forget, we have gone through different uh, world wars. Then at the end, we understood that in the diversity, looking for the rich part of the society is the best way to arrive at a commitment, a compromise. So thank you very much for coming. I'm going to give the word to our coordinator, who wants also to say some few words. Uh, Professor Tilly, please. Let me uh, indeed maybe first react to your uh, beautiful speech. Uh, and keynote actually, because as you said, it was really uh, uh, a presentation from uh, a professor. Uh, we we really understood your expertise, and but coming back to let's say more the policy side of your role, I would say first that uh, uh, let me thank you because you are, you expressed uh, basically the vision that we are trying to uh, put into practice. This is challenging, uh, but we like challenges, let's say. We will hopefully succeed. And even if we don't fully succeed, we will have gone through steps which will change forever the way we are working together. And as you said, uh, this will enhance the mutual understanding through the languages, but also through the all activities that we are performing. And you are the excellent example of what we can have as a wise policymaker who understands what is a university, what, what it means to take decisions that are based on evidence, based on research expertise. And honestly, I wish that all policymakers would be like you <laughs> at all levels, including at the Commission level and European level. So thank you very much for, for your hard work because this is instrumental in how the universities are trying to help society. And of course, we know that there is always this tension that sometimes universities have been or still are seen as sort of ivory towers. 
But I think that these things are gone in the sense that universities, typically through this initiative of alliances, but this was already there uh, for many years, if not decades, they understood that part of their core mission is indeed this idea of connecting with society. But the whole question is, is society ready to hear what universities have to say? And are policy makers ready to hear what academics and, and uh, students have to say? And, and this is indeed a very, very strong tension because we know that policy makers have a quite short term approach to uh, problems which can be easily understood because they need to respond. But the role of universities is to bring on board this long tradition of thinking, critical thinking. And what we are really trying in the ec Alliance is not just to extend the cooperation among the seven universities uh, through the multilingualism, through the different aspects of what are our missions, but it's also to embark the people around, the policymakers, the students, to create a true European community. We have, although you said indeed there is a diversity of languages, but there is a, 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 European, a European identity. And this is what we want to make as the most obvious shared value. So indeed, when I was uh, a bit earlier opening uh, this uh, forum, uh, referring to the, a few years ago, to the 800th anniversary of uh, the University of Salamanca, that makes it one of the oldest in the world, there was at that time the, also a meeting on the Magna Carta, that is really putting the values at the center of everything. And our society desperately needs values to be back to the center of our discussions. Uh, not just short-term issues, but really why are we making a society altogether? And multilingualism is a part of the, the bond, a part of the the, 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 the glue that makes us all together. And I, I hope actually that the alliances and in particular ec 2 you uh, can bring a, a significant contribution to, to making this glue uh, becoming uh, very strong and, and will change hopefully the European system and European uh, uh, policy uh, um, diplomacy in a way, because we can be a role model in, in the world. So hopefully the vision that you shared with us uh, will be something that uh, we can continue to count on for the next years. So thank you. Thank you very much. I just wanted to, to react because this, what you said was actually very, very important. Thank you. And now um, I, I, we don't have time for, for discussion because we are jumping to, to the next session. Anyway, I would love to thank you again uh, on behalf of uh, the University of Salamanca, but especially on behalf of the whole European campus of City University family and alliance. Uh, I, I knew that it was she was going to give us uh, important points. In 25 minutes, we have received a whole um, structure of different points that are essential for what we are struggling for. So thank you again, really. And uh, we count on you, not only with this contribution, but uh, for supporting us as Deputy Minister. And I'm sure that uh, I know and I'm convinced that we'll uh, just count on your support and uh, energetic uh, contributions for the future. Thank you again for coming. So. Uh, now we are going to start with this uh, following session uh, in enhancing ECTU links between education and research. Uh, I would invite uh, Professor Teddy is still here. Uh, Daniela Saitu, please. Uh, Professor Manuel Gameiro. And Raul. Uh, and Professor Sanchez, please. I'm going. Oh, I don't know what. Yeah. Please. 
Thank you very much, Efrem. So uh, I'm very happy to moderate this uh, next session uh, on the public forum of the EC2 Alliance. Uh, once again, I'm Ludovic Tilly, the coordinator of the EC2 Alliance, uh, and this is for those who are joining online, uh, because the, the whole conference is uh, broadcast on the USAL TV. And I would like actually to uh, thank the technical team for the beautiful work they are doing. Um, this session is entitled Enhancing EC2U Links Between Education and Research. And this actually uh, directly follows the discussion we just had with the Deputy Minister Gartes. Because among the, 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 the primary goals of our alliance, EC2 Alliance, we really want to put at the center not just education, but also research, innovation, and of course service to society. So the, the way we will uh, uh, walk through this uh, session is I will first uh, recall what is the EC2 Alliance with a short presentation. Uh, and among this, uh, this presentation, you will see that we have created already a few months ago, during the first year of the EC2 Alliance, an instrument that we are convinced will help enhancing the link between education and research, and namely what we called the EC2U Virtual Institutes. I will say a bit further uh, when I will present. And after that, each of the scientific coordinators that are also work package leaders of the EC2 Alliance will give you a flavor in 10 minutes each of what does it mean uh, a virtual institute, what are they promoting, and then after the three presentations from my colleagues, I will come back with another example of how we put research and innovation at the very center of the EC2 Alliance with a recent program that we have been granted with, from the Horizon 2020 European program called Research and Innovation for Cities and Citizens. And I will briefly show what we are going to do in the next three years. And this will uh, bring us to the end of this uh, session. So let me first provide again an overview of what is the EC2U Alliance. As you can see on the first slide, the uh, EC2U Alliance, meaning European Campus of City Universities, uh, has been selected by the European Commission last year, so we are soon celebrating the first year of this uh, ambitious project, ambitious alliance, uh, and we will receive, we are receiving funding from the Commission for uh, the period of three years, 2020-2023. And hopefully, after that, we will again receive funding from the Commission to continue to extend the cooperation. So what is the ECT Alliance? Well, first, the core uh, part of the consortium is composed of seven universities. Uh, we are here in Salamanca, so obviously it's a member of the ECT Alliance. But we have also uh, the University of Coimbra in Portugal, the University Alexandru Ioan Cusa in Iași, Romania. We also have the University Friedrich Schiller in Jena, Germany. We have the University of Pavia in Italy, University of Poitiers in France, my home university, uh, University of Turku in Finland, and of course, as I said earlier, Salamanca. But that's not about it. We also have decided to bring on board associated partners that are key actors of our society. Namely, we have the seven municipalities that are officially embarked into this journey. We also have some regional agencies, regional governments. Of course, very important, we have students' associations because all what we are doing is in the end for the students. So it has to be for the students, but with the students. It's a co-design, it's a co-creation mechanism. And this week, actually, we uh, each university sent some students here in Salamanca and I hope they are having a good time, but it's not just about fun. It's also that they are starting to discuss, to cooperate, and to speak with each other, which is, again, this topic of multilingualism. We also have some science parks, some socioeconomic actors, typically chambers of commerce, etc. These 30 associated partners are key 
partners to us. And just before uh, the, uh, the public conference this morning, we had the EC2 Plenary Council where we have all the partners together with us. And we could see that actually already there is very strong cooperation going on between the municipalities, between the students' associations and so on. And it's a real pleasure for all of us to see that all these efforts that we are trying to develop are making things becoming real. This is really uh, important. In a few facts and figures, uh, the EC2U Alliance gathers 162, about 162 students, about 20,000 staff, including researchers, teachers, but also administrative staff. Uh, also, the, the seven universities for the past decade, they have already uh, coordinated and been granted more than 600 European projects. So we actually dare to say that we have a strong expertise in European projects. Hopefully we will see if it serves the Alliance. We also see that uh, when we prepared this project, we saw that we were already cooperating in research. And typically for, again, the past decade, we could see that we had already more than 1,200 research papers published where from two up to five uh, universities are co-authoring these papers. So which means that the research among the Alliance is already very active and we built our project on this. And also very importantly, the seven cities and municipalities or metropolitan areas are bringing together 1.6 million citizens. And this is also very important to realize this because we want to reach out these citizens and you will see how. What you see now is the research profiles of our seven universities. So it may, it may look a bit small, so I, apologies for that. But what you see here are the seven universities in a, a graph which is called the Wheel of Science, where you see a color code and some dots. The size of the dot is related to the, the strengths of a research field, typically number of publications and the color refers to the uh, different fields. Typically, you see all the, the blue shades are related to what we would typically call the natural and hard sciences, physics, mathematics, etc. All the green shades are related to environment and biology. The red and pink con uh, is related to the, the health-related uh, 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 topics and all the orange and yellow uh, corresponds to the social sciences and humanities. And first, as you can see, our seven uh, universities are comprehensive. We almost have all disciplines. They are very much looking similar, but they also are very complementary. And now if we look at how we are already uh, cooperating, and this is the next slide, you see the same graph with the joint publications that we could identify during the past decade. So these uh, 1,221 uh, joint publications. And they also gather around points of interest, which means that th there are some uh, focus of joint research in our alliance. And typically, we do find some in the hard sciences, but also in energy and, and environmental sciences, health and biology, and also on SSH, social sciences and humanities. And when we realized that we had already this very strong research cooperation, we decided to use it and to embed it into a much uh, well-recognized framework, which are the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. These goals have been uh, put forward by the United Nations. There are 17, and you see here these 17s. And based on the previous graph, we realized that we were altogether already very strong in three of them. Of course, this is not the only three that are, uh, uh, for, for which we are very strong, but we had to decide to select a, a small number first, and in the next years we'll continue to deploy our uh, common effort. But 
clearly we could see that already we are very strong in good health and well-being, in quality education and sustainable cities and communities. And actually all these three topics are very much related to this idea of strong bond to the society. In a way, we were somehow maybe visionary, I dare to say, because this was uh, proposed in 2019 and uh, yeah, 2019, and actually a, a year later, we all uh, faced the uh, worldwide pandemic. So clearly, this idea of good health and well-being is more than ever relevant, and we are already working on it. So the way we have designed the EC2U Alliance is what you can see now as we call the EC2U Temple. Uh, it is based, uh, it, it, it shows actually all the group of activities, what we called in the European project jargons, the work packages. These work packages are each led by a different university, but we are participating to all activities. It's really a global effort, a collegial approach to it. And among these different uh, work packages, let me just tell you that three are, I wouldn't say more important than others because they are all important. But in this topic of making a link between research and education, three are particularly uh, important. This is the work package four, five and six that I will present a bit later on. But before that, let me just tell you that when we design uh, the uh, EC2 uh, Alliance, we really want to create a pan-European campus that offers all the services to its community, the students and the staff. Which means that we will develop typically uh, some shared learning spaces, some joint cultural events, some sports events. Actually our students this week have already shared some sports events and they will tonight also have some intercultural mixing uh, and this will continue until, until the end of the week. We have already had the first EC2U science battle where we showed that we can compete but we can also share uh, the knowledge with the people. What we are also needing to make our alliance working is digital platforms and digital tools. And this is what we have under the so-called Connect Center. After a, a year of activity, these uh, tools will soon be available and they will allow us to uh, manage mobility uh, between the students and, and the staff to have the first so-called knowledge hub that will, that will give us the, the possibility to interrogate each of the different system uh, at the university. So we, we need these digital tools now to operate all together. We will also have the EC2 student cards and many other things. I will not go in all the details, but just to tell you that in three years we will deliver more than 300 deliverables. So that's a real challenge and hopefully will succeed. Also, we are trying to extend uh, our impact to the outer world, if I may say. And by this, I mean we are really trying to involve citizens. And we do this through three types of activities, namely what we call the European talents, the European education, and the European engagement. Uh, I will not again go into the details, you can find many, many information on the ec website, but just to tell you that we are very committed to transfer all this knowledge to the people and to really bring them with us into this journey. So now actually let me, let me just briefly go back on this idea of virtual institutes, because they will be the core engines of this uh, possibility to really bring together education and research to make a difference, to make an impact to the society. And again, we will focus on the three UN SDGs that I mentioned earlier, the good health and well-being, the quality education, and the sustainable cities and uh, communities. The concept of a virtual institute should be really understood as a new way of cooperation a sort of laboratory without walls, because we don't want it to be located specifically somewhere, it will be shared between the seven universities. Usually the wording institute 
is understood in terms of research. Here, the virtual institute, the EC2U virtual institute, has to be understood as the place where all people interested in participating to the education and research effort will work together. It means not just researchers, it means teachers, it means also students. Researchers can be also understood as senior but also young researchers. We want all these forces to work together because we need all actors to really achieve the, 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 the challenge, the, the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, because it is more urgent than ever to really make an impact. If we wait without doing, only speaking, we will never uh, reach uh, the, uh, this, uh, this SDGs. So the virtual institutes, uh, we have created them a few months ago. Uh, there are three to start, but with time they will continue to develop in number, addressing more and more of the SDGs. So the first three uh, virtual institutes has, are, of course, one on good health and well-being, the second one on quality education, and the third one on sustainable cities and uh, communities. They are going now to develop activities in education. Among these ones, we will next year open the first EC2U joint master programs. These will be completely new interdisciplinary uh, master programs that are not, uh, let's say, structured uh, in the traditional way. They are mixing today together the different disciplines and the different existing expertise at the seven universities. And they will bring a new way uh, to the students to be trained, typically in this idea of a challenge-based approach. So my colleagues will say a few words about that. So this is already prepared. We will open next year. And of course, now we are also opening the activities to the research field. And within this virtual institute, we can really make a very strong bond between education and research. So now my colleagues are going one after another to present a few examples of what is going on now at the virtual institutes. And let me just first introduce uh, my colleague from University of Yash, Professor Do Daniela Soitu. She is the work package leader in charge of the first uh, virtual institute for good health and well-being. Uh, Daniela, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Tilly. Uh, thank you uh, very much, dear coordinator of uh, the Yes to You uh, Alliance. It's a, a pleasure and an honor to contribute with uh, uh, some knowledge uh, uh, to in this uh, uh, historical uh, place and uh, have a piece uh, up upon another uh, of those uh, collecting during uh, 800 uh, years. Uh, how uh, um, uh, we will do this? <laughs> uh, by the previously mentioned Virtual Institute for uh, Good Health and uh, Well-Being, and uh, allow me to uh, synthesize a couple of activities we had uh, perform, performed during the first year of uh, the project. Uh, first of all, this uh, virtual institute uh, for good health and uh, well-being is based on a couple of uh, uh, pillars. The first pillar is a literacy lab. And um, uh, what uh, kind of uh, literacy we intend to offer uh, focused uh, with subjects focused on uh, social determinants of health, on healthy aging, on smart aging. And uh, one of the activities we've uh, scheduled uh, for um, one for in, in each of the three years of the project uh, refer to uh, summer schools. And we've already uh, host in uh, Yash, at the Alexandru Ioan Cuza University of uh, Yash, the first uh, summer school called Smart Aging and uh, Healthy Life. And uh, on the left corner, you uh, can see some images uh, moving uh, and showing some uh, uh, of the activities and impression of students uh, who participated in the, in the summer school. Uh, 
next to uh, this uh, uh, activity. Uh, it's um, our uh, intention to uh, have interdisciplinary uh, teams performing transformative research and getting to uh, a hub of uh, transformative uh, research on the same uh, topics, lifelong well-being and uh, uh, healthy uh, aging. Why transformative? Uh, not because it's a uh, um, fashionable uh, word, but uh, because uh, uh, it involves, uh, uh, as uh, Professor Tilly have mentioned, uh, students, researchers, uh, academic and administrative staff, uh, living uh, in the city, not only in the campus. We, we didn't forget uh, the campus, and campus meaning not only the uh, building uh, accommodating students around the university, but uh, uh, the campus as a place of uh, uh, living, sharing, learning, uh, and uh, growing. De uh, achieving, developing uh, knowledges, relations, and uh, uh, reaching uh, different objectives. Uh, this is a new and innovative idea which we will uh, uh, develop together with our uh, colleagues from the University of Jena and uh, the colleagues from the other partner universities. Uh, in, in order to do that, uh, we have already organized uh, two workshops um, as, as a floor to share the best practices from the seven uh, universities, best practices uh, from the administrative uh, staff and used by uh, students to, uh, and students associations in order to support uh, uh, their colleagues, their peers during the mobility. And uh, uh, it was not just uh, a storytelling uh, during these uh, workshops. We, uh, it was a real uh, occasion to learn from each other. Um, it, ha it happens that uh, this project have, um, um, uh, has been visionary in the activities uh, um, planned. And one of these activities, uh, it's called uh, online uh, peer counseling lab. Uh, it has started uh, already and uh, it works uh, very well, and it, it was really appropriate uh, during last academic year for the students uh, uh, being uh, on a mobility in other country, other city, other university, being uh, uh, in the lockdown uh, uh, situation. Uh, they had the opportunity to discuss with their peers, preparing themselves for, for the psychology. Uh, so students, we are talking about uh, future psychologists, uh, supporting, offering support to their peers, of course, under the supervision of the uh, clinicians uh, and uh, uh, respecting all the ethical rules and uh, uh, academic, uh, academic rules. Uh, this is uh, working uh, and we will continue to, to, uh, to develop. Uh, as uh, uh, Professor Ludovic Tille has uh, mentioned, uh, a very important uh, uh, step in uh, uh, building and developing the cooperation between the seven university is to answer to a major challenge. It's a kind of European challenge, uh, framing a joint master program in a certain topic. And what we have uh, worked on during the last year is the uh, joint master program called Lifelong Well-Being and Healthy Aging with uh, the, an acronym Lifeline, uh, as the Virtual Institute have the acronym GLADE. And uh, I would like to thank you to the Vice Rector of uh, University of Poitiers, Christine uh, Fernandez, who helped us with uh, these uh, nice acronyms. And we embrace it and uh, uh, use them. What you've seen uh, on, the right uh, on the right corner of uh, the screen, it's a, uh, a promotional uh, video for the master program. We have succeeded to uh, accredited as a national master program in uh, Romania, but uh, uh, we didn't stop uh, here because uh, uh, you see, uh, previously, uh, Professor Thierry said uh, that we have some strong points in the alliance. But as you know, the better is the enemy of good, so we want to do better and better. 
uh, and uh, on this uh, uh, on this way uh, we are working on uh, the uh, applications for uh, new accreditation uh, uh, processes in uh, uh, by the University of Pavia and the University of Poitiers, for instance, and uh, uh, the other colleagues from the uh, other universities are working also on uh, on this. What we um, have started to uh, to do for the next uh, year of uh, the project, uh, continuing to uh, work on the three uh, pillars previously mentioned. But uh, this work is not uh, uh, an unpleasant work. It's uh, pleasant by the challenges uh, uh, it raises. So um, uh, regarding the literacy uh, lab, lab, we are uh, preparing uh, a kind of uh, uh, GLADE conferences, one per month, uh, in order to uh, uh, enhance the uh, sharing, uh, the process of uh, sharing knowledges and practices and, re and uh, researches uh, on the topic of good health and uh, well-being. We are uh, waiting uh, for the uh, next summer school, which will be hosted by the uh, University of uh, Pavia next year, and uh, uh, also encouraging our uh, colleagues to um, uh, share their knowledge to the community using the technologies. That means uh, recorded uh, uh, short trainings in the area of good health and uh, well-being. And uh, uh, in less than two weeks, we will uh, release the first study on lifelong well-being and healthy aging, uh, performing a comparative analysis of the 17 targets uh, associated to this third objective, uh, good health and uh, well-being. And it's uh, the right time to uh, start to work with uh, the community uh, in order to develop guidelines for local authorities on the same topic, good health and well-being. And we will link this with uh, uh, the campuses, uh, what means uh, uh, city universities. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll continue to develop this uh, management service of a uh, healthy campus uh, by a short uh, uh, study. Uh, we will be able to, uh, to share the results uh, on the uh, next um, forum and uh, uh, using the project uh, uh, links and uh, other conferences. And uh, yeah, uh, we are inviting uh, you all who are watching and listen uh, uh, now on YouTube or other um, uh, media to consider uh, applying to this new and challenging master program, Lifelong Wellbeing and uh, Healthy Aging. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daniela. So you, you have a flavor of what we are doing under this topic of uh, good health and well-being uh, under the Virtual Institute uh, with the same name. So now it's a pleasure to introduce my other colleague, Raul Sanchez, who is the leader of the Work Package 5, but also the scientific coordinator of the second Virtual Institute on Quality Education. The floor is yours, Raul. Thank you very much, Ludovic. And may I have the slides, uh, please? Okay, thank you. Uh, so, the Virtual Institute for Quality Education combines education, research and innovation for advanced studies on quality education. Within the three-year framework of our project, only a pilot project profile of this Virtual Institute will be developed and fully implemented language, cultural, and societal diversity in Europe. So all activities that we are developing and that will be developed in the next two years are related to European languages, cultures, and societies. Our virtual institute has already finished one of its core activities. Uh, we have submitted, each board member of WEP5 has submitted an application uh, for the accreditation of a joint multilateral master's degree to our, our respective uh, national or regional accreditation agency. 
We hope that we will start our Master in European Languages, Cultures and Societies in contact uh, next year, at least some of our universities. This activity has been a rather difficult one uh, due to the extremely different accreditation procedures and requirements in the seven countries and to the lack of implementation of the European approach. Besides this activity, we are currently working on the following three research-related activities, initiatives. We will be implementing in the next months a uh, uh, research seed mobility program on language and cultural diversity for researchers. We are working on the first common research project of our virtual institute, uh, the research, the language policy and multilingualism in European universities research project. And we are beginning to design joint PhD training activities for the existing PhD programs on uh, European languages and uh, cultures. I will now outline uh, the three initiatives in the following minutes. I will start with the research seed mobility program on language and cultural diversity. The main objective of uh, this research seed mobility program is to actively promote in-depth collaboration, research collaboration among researchers and research groups of the seven EC2U universities. Uh, already existing research groups working on languages, cultures and societies in contact, as well as on education as a vehicle of language and cultural diversity, they are expected to work together uh, to form EC2U research clusters, to develop research seed projects, and then to apply for additional national and uh, European funding. So researchers working on multilingualism, on contrastive linguistics, on comparative literature, heritage languages, international gender studies, intercultural studies, intercultural communication or in the digital humanities are encouraged to apply for one or two mobilities. The Virtual Institute will fund a total of nearly 300 mobilities, more or less 44 per university. Candidates must express their interest in participating to the Virtual Institute prior to the submission of the mobility proposal, but this is just a formality. They must hold an academic position at one of the seven EC2U universities, which allows them to engage in research activities for the duration of the research project, of the mobility project, uh, and a position that also includes the ability to independently publish research results. Their mobility grants will cover the attendance of researchers to work in sessions aimed at preparing national and European research and development project applications. The, research, uh, the Virtual Institute will organize uh, four to five days meetings at one of our seven universities. There will be several meetings depending on the topics selected by the researchers, and of course depending on the European calls, research for research, research calls. Mobilities must take place between uh, uh, next month, uh, November 2021, and April 2023. And uh, to all uh, interested, please, if you are interested, please contact your virtual institute representative at your university. The second activity we are working on now is the research project Language Policy on Multilingualism in European Universities. This research project involves uh, more than 15 researchers from the seven universities. The aim main of the project is to study the current language policies at universities taking part in European alliances and also at universities that, which are not, enga not engaged officially in uh, official European alliances. The research team adopts a comparative approach to study language policy practices. Um, the research design is both qualitative and quantitative and incorporates research methods uh, from uh, 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 the humanities, from the social sciences, uh, and also from the digital humanities. Uh, we will analyze the current language policies in European universities from very different points of view. The University of Salamanca is responsible for the analysis of the language policies on the ground, and we will hear more about it uh, later in the day. The University of Poitiers, under the leadership of Professor Valetopoulos, will study the language policy implications of foreign language didactics. 
The University of Turku, under the leadership of Professor Daivalkovsky Shilov, is now currently designing the role of translation studies in language policy. The last two universities, Poitiers and Turku, will also analyze the institutional language policies from a multilingual point of view and also incorporating digital linguistics. The University of Pavia will be developing the computational linguistic part of the project under the leadership of Professor Jezek. The University of Coimbra, under the leadership of Professor Keating, will concentrate on critical discourse analysis and linguistic ethnography applied to language policy documentation. The University Yuan Kuza of Yash, under the leadership of Professor Popper, will examine education policies and language education. And the University of Vienna, represented here by Dr. Yolanda Lopez, will be working on the social imaginaries and the role of migrants in university language policy. We will examine uh, language policy practices at Portuguese, Spanish, French, Italian, German, Romanian, Finnish, Dutch, and Belgian universities. And the last activity I would like to present is our joint PhD training activities. In fact, um, there are two training activities which are to be developed in the second and third year of the project. We plan to offer workshops and courses for the existing PhD uh, uh, programs on European languages and cultures. The main aim of the training activities is to, be, to prepare future university uh, teachers to multilingual European campuses in a world shaped by artificial intelligence. And these activities will be the first step towards future fully integrated PhD programs. And our funding tool are again mobilities. We will offer up to 70 student mobilities. So we will organize the workshops for future university staff in the next uh, two spring uh, semesters under the denomination New Multilingual Learning and Teaching Spaces for European Campuses. Uh, and we will further support the organization of two PhD intensive courses on machine learning techniques and text processing tools applied to the study of linguistic diversity and cultural perception. We will have uh, this a workshop or an intensive course every six months. Um, and we will, of course, make a public call for students and also for staff willing to participate in these uh, uh, courses. And the selected uh, candidates will get financial support for traveling and daily allowances. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Raoul. Again, uh, a, a very uh, large number of uh, activities under this second virtual institute that will really make a very strong link between education and research. So now let's have uh, another uh, set of examples regarding the third virtual institute, the one on the sustainable cities and communities. And for this, this is the work package leader, but also the scientific coordinator of the virtual institute, Manuel Gamero from University of Coimbra. Manuel. Thank you very much, uh, Ludovic. Uh, good morning. Uh, okay, be before going in detail into the activities, uh, I would like uh, only to uh, mention uh, why I think uh, the Virtual Institute is really a, a bright idea. Uh, because uh, Professor Ludovic mentioned already that uh, a virtual institute is an institute without walls. And uh, uh, I, I think we may add that uh, uh, it's like a, a very clever way of uh, optimizing uh, the uh, investment do, that has been done uh, till now uh, in each university, either with national funds, either with European funds. Because in each university, we have, uh, let us say, uh, facilities, we have uh, know-how, we have experts, and uh, we know that if we have a group of people, we can go uh, we can cover a, a much longer distance and we can get much better results than if we are working alone. So uh, putting together all these uh, things that we have, it's a, a very well, good way of uh, 
somehow optimizing the uh, all uh, the facilities, all the computers, all the the laboratories, and uh, I. Even there is another aspect that it's uh, uh, interdisciplinarity because we will have people from uh, uh, different scientific areas uh, analyzing uh, the same problem. And of course, if uh, we have different points of view from an object, we will have a much better knowledge of this object. If we have only one point of view, there is always something that will be in the shadow. And uh, uh, this way, having different points of view, uh, it's a, a very good way of analyzing and of uh, getting a, a better expertise of, of something. So uh, in the case of uh, uh, Work Package 6, uh, we are in the, in the virtual institute, of course, we should focus in the uh, different pillars of the university activities, which is education, training, research, knowledge transfer. And uh, uh, as already mentioned by my colleagues, we have the, the master so this is uh, something uh, I, I think quite new in the uh, ECTU. It's uh, to have uh, these uh, uh, joint master programs. And uh, uh, as Professor Ludwig mentioned already, uh, there, there was a big effort in the first year to have these master programs uh, accredited and to be ready to, to start uh, next, next year. And uh, we will be somehow testing different uh, approaches regarding uh, the, this master. So we will be uh, checking what are the best ways of uh, having a master in this type of alliance. So the, besides the, the, master, the master program, we have uh, in what uh, uh, concerns research, uh, two research seed projects to, to start. And uh, uh, these uh, research projects are uh, very important, uh, not only on account of uh, the results that we want uh, to achieve from the scientific point of view in terms of indicators and so on, but also for the uh, cohesion of the alliance, because uh, the best way of uh, uh, having a, a good alliance is uh, to have people working together in the same in the same subject. Uh, it's uh, and in this case we decided to to select uh, like uh, two uh, areas that. Uh, can uh, uh, be important for uh, ECTU. So first of all, uh, as we are dealing with, uh, with the cities and with the problems that we may have uh, in cities now, nowadays, uh, okay, this was defined before the pandemic because if it was uh, a little bit later, maybe it was another topic. But uh, so the first uh, topic uh, is it, uh, where should I point to? to, to yeah. Uh, so uh, the first uh, project is about uh, increasing the resi resilience uh, of uh, uh, sensible groups to the effect of heat waves in European cities in a climate change scenario. Uh, so everybody knows that this is, uh, we have, uh, on account of uh, climate change, uh, the number of uh, heat waves uh, is being uh, increasing. And uh, really, this is a topic that has, uh, for instance, a strong connection with uh, the 
uh, health and well-being. So the, uh, the way the cities are planned and the, the way the buildings are designed and uh, the, the, the type of environment that we have inside the buildings, it's very, very important for the, uh, the wealth of, the, of people. And so in this uh, project, uh, we have uh, uh, the participation of the University of Iagi in the, the topics related with uh, the urban planning and the sustainability. We have uh, the participation of the University of Iena. It's uh, more on the spatial analysis, the human geographic and the physical geography. And uh, the University of Turku who will be dealing also with uh, geographic and uh, GIS, Geographical Information uh, Systems. And uh, in our case, the University of Coimbra, we will be dealing with indoor environmental quality and the sustainable built environment. Uh, the other project, uh, okay, it's, uh, this is about uh, uh, how the, the, pro the project A is uh, defined, but uh, okay, I. I may go to the project B. Okay, so the project B, it's about the, it, it should be something with a ECTU stamp. So it was uh, what we, we wanted. And uh, our cities, uh, so uh, are cities with uh, university campus, uh, that uh, somehow have many buildings with, uh, let us say, uh, heritage uh, character. So these are, uh, as you, we, we can see in this room, for instance, uh, I was, uh, I would like to call your attention how a recent technology is integrated in this uh, in this building in such a, uh, let us say, a, a clever way. So you, you see all the electrical plugs uh, are in the same color as the, the wood. And so, uh, and uh, Salamanca in itself is really an amazing city because uh, we see here in the city center so many historic buildings and so uh, I think and uh, having a comfortable and healthy uh, uh, let us say buildings when we have historic center and uh, it's a, a quite important challenge from many point of, points of view first of all I think from the, the law point of view because it's uh, uh, we have uh, different constraints uh, we have also problems with architecture technology we have, may have problems with the built environment we uh, may have also participation from energy efficiency and uh, sustainability so uh, we have uh, all these uh, topics being addressed by uh, the University of Salamanca, the University of Pavia, the University of Poitiers, and the uh, University of, of Coimbra. Okay, so finally, we, it, Ludovic is uh, looking at me, but I'm uh, uh, almost uh, in, in time. Uh, so just uh, one more topic to be addressed. We will uh, have a, a strong connection uh, of uh, these topics from the Virtual Institute also with the, with the Master. And in the Master, we will have uh, some courses uh, that uh, will, in the first semester, one course dealing with uh, uh, an introduction to uh, sustainable cities and communities. And in the second semester, uh, another course about the governance of sustainable cities and communities. And in these two courses, we'll be addressing the 10 sub-targets of the uh, Sustainable Development Goal 11. That somehow deal with uh, 
a very uh, broad area like mobility, energy, environment, uh, urban planning, regional planning. Uh, so, and we will use this as a way to uh, put together uh, either the seven universities, either the associated partners, because we will invite experts uh, from the seven universities and also from the associated partners to contribute to these, these courses. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Does it? Yeah, now it works. Thank you. Thank you, Manuel, very much for these examples of uh, the activities that are going to happen under the third virtual institute. The last part of this session uh, goes back to me. I would like to give you more examples on how the ECT Alliance is going really to move forward in this very strong synergy between education, research and innovation. And for that, I think the most important is to have the slides again. Um, we are now uh, actually starting uh, another European project that has been granted to the, the Alliance called Research and Innovation for Cities and Citizens, uh, I4C2. I will unfortunately go very briefly through the slides, but the, the main message hopefully will be uh, uh, clear enough. Uh, we are actually... Um, uh, we have been awarded, as I just said, some Horizon 2020 funding. An extra two million was allocated to the uh, to the alliance, and uh, the project started last September. So we have just started, in a way. Uh, we are going with this additional funding to extend, in addition to what we just heard, to continue to extend the, the activities of the Alliance to the research and innovation fields. And we are going to do so through what is called transformation modules. Actually, you see on that slide, which is very small uh, and not maybe so interesting, that there is a very strong connection between the two projects, the Erasmus, that is basically constructing the alliance and this Horizon 2020 project. I don't want to go too much into details here. It's a little bit boring. The most important part is that we are going to really address very important challenges in how we perform research and innovation. And it will start with what we call the transformation management, where we will pave the way towards a joint research and innovation series of activities. For that, we need really to, what we call, create a pan-European knowledge ecosystem. There will be another set of activities where we will develop a joint research and innovation agenda. Uh, this one is led by the University of Salamanca. Again, I will not go through all the details, but this will be key for the future of our alliance. Another activity will deal about really placing people doing research innovation at the center. It is what we call the people empowerment. There, this is the, the University of Coimbra who will lead, and in particular, there will be a very strong focus on gender equality in research. Another set of activities will be to make available to all universities some joint research and innovation platforms. This will be developed by the University of Pavia, and this will be a continuation of what I presented earlier, the so-called EC2 Connect Center. We are also going, with the help of the University of Vienna, to develop what we call the innovation spheres. Uh, sphere, sorry. Uh, this innovation sphere will actually bring on board all the actors uh, uh, involved in the innovation process and will, around the, uh, along the three years, go, are going to uh, develop lecture series, but also we will create a network of lighthouses of innovation and we will also uh, uh, develop a makeathon. The, the, the next set of activities will be about creating a true knowledge ecosystem. For that, and this will be led by University of Yash, we are going to develop a common framework for the seven local knowledge ecosystems. We will also work on uh, uh, citizen science, which means that citizens can be 
actors of research and innovation. The next set of activities will be what we call the Open EC2U, which means that we are going to develop all the, go the, the tools and guidelines to develop uh, uh, open access in research and uh, innovation, something which is absolutely fundamental for the future of research, and this will be led by University of Turku. Uh, and last but not least, we are going to uh, disseminate beyond the, uh, the ECT Alliance through different types of fora, but also coordinating uh, joint activities with other alliances. So this is where we are going to stop now, to stop now this session on the ECT links between education and research. Uh, I hope that those in the room, but also those connected online, uh, will have uh, a good idea of what we are going to, uh, we are going to achieve all together to make the ECT Alliance an impactful uh, and uh, a, a real transformation into the higher education, but also research field. So I thank my colleagues for their presentations. I thank you all for your attention. And now we will move on to uh, the next session. Thank you all. Thank you very much. So now my colleague, the Vice Rector, Elfrem Yildiz, will come to the stage and you will take the floor for moderating the next session. ¿Podemos poner la presentación, por favor? No es esta, ¿no? Just a bit of patience, we are now putting it on our slides and we'll start immediately. While we are uh, waiting, I could use the time to tell you that we are going to have lunch at the same place where we uh, ate yesterday. So, in La Sala de Pinturas in Colegio Fonseca, please don't forget that, okay? Yeah, 
tienen. Sí. Ok, muchas gracias. Um, just go to the next slide. Yeah, this is exactly what we wanted to have. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, now allow me to jump to another uh, important issue related to what we are developing. Uh, as one of the important issues and topics that will be for sure uh, one of the reasons we will work with the other, other, other partners. Uh, European universities, language policies you know, uh, on the ground. Uh, you know, before, before giving the role to, to my uh, good friend and colleague, uh, Raul Sanchez, I would love to underline an important issue in relation to this topic. Uh, he will talk about a very specific uh, uh, issue and I will provide you with a small, in five minutes, with a vision which is linked directly to, the, to what, the, um, let's say, the language policy of the university is uh, as it is. Of course, uh, one of the main let's say, part of uh, what uh, the, the University of Salamanca is developing is related directly to Spanish language. Uh, we have a very strong uh, department, and at the same time, we have also a specific school at the university where we teach uh, per year for about uh, an average of 8,000, 7, 8, until 11,000 students who come to Salamanca experience an excellent uh, experience uh, learning the Spanish language in a very practical way. <clears throat> uh, said that, also, uh, we are talking about languages. Uh, our deputy minister this morning has underlined the importance of multilingualism. And Salamanca uh, has started many years ago with this needed policy. We teach currently at the Faculty of Philology 23 different languages. So we have a big experience in that sense. And this is why somehow uh, the University of Salamanca is leading uh, this third, let's say, uh, important pillar of what EC2U is developing. Uh, quality education. Uh, the 23 languages are not only Indo-European languages per se. We combine both, let's say, important uh, parts, Indo-European languages and Semitic on the other side. Even we are trying now to include Hamito-Semitic languages. I, I could give you um, uh, I, I could provide you with many uh, information, but I'm not going to bore you with, with the whole process of the different structures and so on. But just allow me to tell you that we are really fostering the learning of languages at our university because we have discovered many, many years, even centuries ago, the importance of the sharing views, uh, ways of thinking, that are only possible to make them available to, the, to our neighbors and to our colleagues through the language. This is why the combination of different languages and learning at the same time two or three or even four languages at the Faculty of Philology is one of the, our strengths. What my colleague is going to, to focus on is going to be a totally different branch of what a uh, linguistic uh, research project can represent. <clears throat> but allow me to take you back a bit, because he will talk about symbols, signs, that probably not um, are considered as, you know, as a part, a fundamental part of the modern research uh, groups where both sides, symbols and language are uh, connecting in a very special way. Symbols are, uh, somehow, if you go back to the first science of the scripture, 
they were symbols. Just have a look at the, at the Mesopotamian, Assyrian, Babylonian um, writing system, Egyptian, Luvian, and so on. You will see at the beginning they were only symbol signs that were connecting the different uh, society strata within those uh, aspects where symbol uh, has become a kind of communication. And we are at, at, at a university level where we see many uh, symbols that are used, but we don't really give the importance they deserve. And this is why, for sure, uh, our colleague, uh, Raul Sanchez, will talk about language policies on the ground. This is, will be with one foreign languages or language didactics, translation studies, uh, computer sciences applied to the linguistic, and he will also insist on the education policies that have been still mentioned. So I'm not going to, to focus on uh, what he is going to talk about, but what, in my opinion, is absolutely needed, not only at a local level or regional or national level, but at an international level, is this uh, synergies between the societies through the language. But we have to learn them. And the best place where the languages can be learned in a structured way, in a professional way, let's say, is the university. And this is why the humanities must take this part of uh, education as a serious issue. Because the unique way where we can really create this connection, synergies between even the, the countries our continent is combined by so many different languages. But if we want to know about each other, if we want to learn about each other, the best way, as our deputy minister has underlined this morning, is through the language. And we don't have other chance. This is why uh, we are happy to have an expert in the linguistics who manages, I can confess here, he doesn't like it, uh, he is probably one of the uh, fewest who knows so many languages at the University of Salamanca. But combined, Uralic languages with the Indo-European languages, and of course the modern ones, he speaks them so fluent that at the end we are so proud having him as not only colleague, but as an expert at our university. So thank you, uh, Raul, for accepting to give um, uh, a conference or a communication, a short communication about a topic that honestly is not so uh, sometimes so often studied at, inter, uh, at the, uh, the university or academic level. So the role is yours. Thank you. The IFRM, thank you very much for your words. I feel ashamed. Okay, so I have been uh, asked to present a part of the language policy project which will be developed in the next two years in the framework of the EC2U Virtual Institute for Quality Education. As I have already said before, this project involves more than 15 researchers and the research team members uh, will analyze the current language policies in European universities from very different points of view. Uh, so that I can say that, that this is a truly interdisciplinary research project that will not only take a closer look at language policies of our seven East to universities, then I have already said that we will be examining language policy practices at Portuguese, Spanish, French, Italian, German, Romanian, Finnish, Dutch and Belgian universities. I will present uh, a first approach to the uh, lingu landscape linguistics part of the project. Uh, the research we are currently developing, therefore, is uh, both qualitative and quantitative, and is aimed at overcoming some critical methodological issues I will refer to later on. Uh, so our main goal is to empirically describe the linguistic landscape of different types of European universities, and to carry out an in-depth analysis of the current language policies in universities. And as you may imagine, examining language, university language policy practices on the ground involves lots of work. But I won't present now 
results because we don't have yet the results. We are beginning. So, uh, you may have never heard of landscape linguistics as a research methodology. Uh, even if you are a scholar working in the humanities, you may not know exactly what landscape linguistics is and which research methods it applies. It applies. So please allow me to introduce you to the research field of linguistic landscapes. The research field of linguistic landscape, and I quote here Horter, is a specialization in applied linguistics, social linguistics, and language policy studies. And it may be one of the most pertinent ways of studying language policy practices on the ground. The aim of this relatively new branch of applied linguist linguistics is to categorize and describe the linguistic items found in the public space. And I quote here Shohami. Shohami is one of the most important scholars uh, working on linguistic landscapes. If you ask me what we understand under public space, I will not be able to answer your question in uh, an exact manner. Uh, landscape linguistics deals uh, mostly with the public sphere where one or more languages or language communities interact with each other. In our concrete case, the public space is reduced to university campuses and university buildings. Since universities do usually have some kind of explicit of, or at least uh, implicit language policy, examining the linguistic landscape of universities is a very appropriate way of assessing those language policies. We already have pioneering studies being conducted in the 70s and 80s, and also 90s. However, the research field involving linguistic landscapes has developed very quickly over the past 20 years following a study by Londrian Bury in 1997, which could be described as seminal. Uh, especially important were the two volumes published by Horter in 2006 and Shohami Horter in 2009, which paved the way for other edited volumes on linguistic landscape. Uh, we have also other very important and significant uh, monographs, for example, Backhouse 2007, uh, Blumart 2013, and Blackwood and Tufi 2015, for example. And we have also the launch of the International Journal of Linguistic Landscape. So we have uh, already publication on this uh, sub-discipline uh, uh, of linguistics. So in short, landscape linguistics is a novel and hands-on way of assessing institutional language policies that can be applied to university language policy. So I would like now to present our first linguistic landscape-based approach for studying language policy and practices in European universities. Landscape linguistics uh, as dealing uh, studies from landscape linguistics dealing with universities are not that common. Among the few studies that have been so far published are those by Brown, 2012, Pitkinen, 2013, uh, and this is a very important study on the linguistic landscape of Helsinki University. And we have more recently also another uh, study by Neat Seals last year, uh, which is a volume dealing with the use of linguistic landscape for foreign language learning. So we have first studies. Uh, the empirical research we intend to do in the framework of the EC2U language policy project has one main characteristic which makes it distinct from those I have briefly described. It adopts a comparative perspective. That means that it examines the public sphere, uh, the public space of several universities located in several universe European countries and compares the results considering the different language legislations that apply at a local, regional, and even in some cases, national level. This is the case, for example, uh, um, the case of Belgium or the case of Finland. So this project therefore adopts a different approach to the bulk of uh, published studies that compare uh, linguistic landscapes. But our study faces several methodological issues that are typical of research into linguistic landscapes. These issues largely involve the collation of and classification of visual material. For example, we have the definition of the units of analysis, 
the classification of the signs found in the linguistic landscape and the representative nature of the corpus created. And I will try now to outline the challenges we are facing. So one of the key issues of the so-called problem of sampling involves defining the units of analysis. Uh, von uh, Menzel Darkin, uh, following other studies by Senos Horter, uh, consider each establishment they photograph to be a unit of analysis. In our case, that will be one university building. This is, in our case, of course, not possible. We have too many signs, posters, printing materials, etc., in one university building. The empirical study we are planning is based on the more textual definition that Backhouse makes of sign in his study on the linguistic landscape in Tokyo. And the definition is any piece of written text within a spatially definable frame. That means that each sign will be counted as one item. This approach has been widely used in many studies and it takes into consideration all visible and maybe repeated linguistic items found in a given public or semi-public space. It thereby allows more accurately defining the urban linguistic landscape. In most cases, it is easy to determine the units of analysis. Sometimes, however, although the spatial boundaries are more or less clear, it is more complicated to reach a decision on the number of units of analysis they form. A good example of this involves uh, the uh, monolingual signs uh, that are clearly defined spatially and repeated in two or more languages. Yeah, such is the example, if I may go. You, you don't see it, of course, uh, but this is, uh, uh, um, uh, we have here two information posters at a door of an office in the Faculty of Economics and Social Sciences uh, from the University of Cologne in Germany. One is in German, the other one is in English. From a spatial perspective, these are two separate units of analysis, that is, two different items, a monolingual one in German and another one in English. Nevertheless, and so as not to distort the linguistic reality, both these uh, posters could be considered one for practical purposes. It could uh, be then classified as bilingual in English and in German. So a further methodological issue involves the classification of signs. Uh, the bulk of studies on linguistic landscapes feature a classification that differen differentiates between top-down and bottom-up signs, or accordingly to the methodology, uh, the terminology used by Backhaus, official and non-official signs. That means regulated and unregulated sign posting. Ben Raphael et Ali, they describe the, this, in, this classification, which we could consider now traditional, which some detail in a study on the construction of the public language domain in Israel. It is essential in our case to differentiate between top-down and bottom-up signs, as one of these studies' main objectives is to determine the degree of compliance with the language policies adopted by the European universities. These language policies may be embedded in regional and national language legislation, such as in Belgium, or also in some Spanish regions, like Catalonia, or not, like here in Salamanca, for example. So we will therefore first begin by identifying all the players involved in the distinction between top-down and bottom-up signs, as Spolsky recommends. An initial differentiation could be made based on what Spolsky refers to as the initiator or owner of the sign, uh, for which for, for most universities it is the rectorate or a faculty or department. Top-down signs are the respective responsibility of the uh, um, um, departments, faculties, and university administrations. The so-called sign maker is usually not identified in these cases. The sign maker is usually an administrative staff member. Uh, in most cases, somebody from the general administration, from the dean's office, or even in the case of departments, a secretary. The sign maker uh, does not seem to be very uh, relevant for our language policy approach except maybe if we are assessing the quality of the foreign language signage. So possible mistakes may reflect the competent language authorities' lack of interest in maintaining linguistic standards in the foreign language or languages. 
Insofar as uh, Spolsky's reader is concerned, the recipient of the signs is not only or are not only the local university communities, that is local students, teaching staff, and administrative staff, incoming students or foreign students and visiting teaching staff and researchers are also the recipient of the signs, particularly of those written in foreign languages. And we should not forget the local population, as well as foreign tourists visiting one of our historic buildings. But we may face here uh, another uh, problems, since communication and signs uh, notices for tourists may not be subject to internal language policy legislation at some universities. Uh, this may be also true in the case of uh, externalized services like university cafeterias or canteens. So anyway, it is crucial to work out a well-designed and uh, well-designed sign taxonomy to classify the signs that are the responsibility of each administrative level. So the general administration or the rectorate, faculties, and maybe also departments. The taxonomy I will present in the following minutes is based on my own observations in several European campuses. I will distinguish four possible sign owners. First, the general university administration overseen by the rector or president of the university. Second, the faculty administration overseen by the dean. Third, the international office overseen by the head of the international office. Uh, four, the main university library overseen by the director of the library. Uh, the university language policy, explicit uh, or not, can be uh, the sole responsibility of the general university administration for all university services, faculties, and spaces. It is generally part of the internationalization strategy. However, as it is usually the case, it can also be part of competencies of the dean, the head of the international office, or the director of the library. And having this in mind, we will empirically analyze the signage in four distinct or five distinct spaces. The main university campus, the main university building, the international office, the faculty of economics, which is usually one of the most popular ones among students and is present at most universities, including universities of applied sciences, and also, of course, the main library. Uh, and this is, of course, uh, field work. So we will visit and, if possible, with permission, of course, take pictures of all signs encountered in these uh, semi-public spaces. So taxonomy. The top-down signs that the general administration is responsible for involve the following type of signage. So first, regarding the outdoor campus signage, we can find campus map signs, orientation, that is way offending signs, brand image signs, institutional ads. So for example, where we see here a monolingual orientation sign on a campus of the University of Poitiers. You see here uh, institutional ads and image, a brand image signs on the central campus of the University of Pavia, also monolingual. And this is this, uh, this slide. In this slide, you can uh, see a brand image sign in front of the main building of the University of Turku. So, in the main administration building, we can see building map signs, building and floor directory signs, orientation signs, brand image signs, room identification signs, office hour signs, of notice board for staff, for students, toilet signs, uh, safety and evacuation signs, name plagues, institutional ads, also flyers and uh, printed materials, so lots of signs. And most of these signs could also be found in the International Relations uh, Office and in the Faculty of Economics, as we will see in the following pictures. So we see here, you don't see it clearly, I know, I uh, apologize for that. So we see here one, uh, two signs at the main entrance of the Faculty of Economics of the University of Salamanca. The bigger one is in Spanish, the smaller one is in English. And here there is a monolingual building and floor directory sign at the Faculty of Economics of the University of Coimbra. You see here a roll-up, uh, uh, which I have problems classifying, uh, maybe a mixture of an institutional ad and brand image sign. It refers to an event organized by the European Alliance for Wellbeing in Cologne past week. 
And here you see our office hour sign at the main door leading to the international office also of Cologne University. And the university library is also very interesting. In the university library here, uh, which is in Yash, University of Yash, uh, there could be in these libraries also very important signs like uh, help desk, uh, library signs, borrowing, instruction signs, so lots of them. So as you see, this taxonomy differentiated, is this differentiated according to, uh, let's say, uh, um, university administrations. And this taxonomy allows a very detailed analysis. So, analysis of bottom-up science, uh, uh, these are the science of a private nature that are not subject to any language regulation, yeah? This analysis of bottom-up science may be quite discordant with the language profile of science. Um, be why? Because they use, tend to be governed by different criteria. It is the unregulated signposting, and this unregulated <laughs> signposting may be shaped by private persons, by companies, yeah, but they will also fall into the scope of the intended empirical research. Uh, I really hope the classification of this type of science proposed here reflects the linguistic and social reality of the survey areas. We may have here very different owners of the sign. Um, um, for example, outdoor on the campus, we may see uh, uh, ads, external ads in the university. We may see stickers, and graffiti, uh, other signs. So it could be really different. And inside the university buildings, that is, in, for example, in the main university building, in the faculties, in the international office, or also in the library building, we could see very different types of bottom-up signs. For example, short-term notices written by staff, so I will come in 10 minutes, uh, they are generally handwritten, uh, external ads, internship ads, also toilet graffiti, which is very interesting. Uh, mostly, of course, they are students, but you never know. Uh, stickers, uh, and uh, also non-institutional flyers and printed uh, uh, material. So, for example, here, handwritten uh, um, short-term uh, uh, notice. This is the University of Vienna, yeah. Notice board, lots of signs in uh, different uh, uh, languages. So these bottom-up categories involve, uh, of course, a more personal choice of language or languages. And precisely herein lies their importance. Uh, through a thorough analysis of the language practices of this bottom-up science will allow us to compare the real language use of students, staff, and the society in general, uh, compare these groups with the official language policy practices in the universities. Uh, so I have now presented the two, two main challenges, the problem of sampling and the classification of science. The third major methodological issue we face is uh, the creation of the copies. The debate over the application of a quantitative or qualitative method is inherent to the research field of linguistic landscape studies. And this debate has even been uh, the main focus of some articles like Horta 2013, uh, as with uh, Blackwood, uh, for whom the discussion on the application of uh, um, quantitative and qualitative approaches is both unhelpful and product productive. I think this is, uh, I share this opinion. So this project has chosen to combine both uh, methods in a symbiotic manner. So on the one hand, the comparative quantitative method is based on counting and classifying all the linguistic landscape signs written in each language or in several languages found in clearly demarcated and similar survey areas. And this provide or will provide a statistical data of a comparable nature between the surveyed universities. But on the other hand, the qualitative method based on observation and reflecting upon the structured data obtained through the quantitative method will enable us to better understand um, the use of languages in the linguistic landscape analyzed and of course their relationship with the university language uh, policies currently in force. And I come now to the final remarks. Uh, obviously we cannot present results yet. 
we are at the beginning of our research activity. In this presentation, I have only attempted to partially describe and discuss the methodology and the problems we, we may be facing in the landscape linguistic part of the ec 2 u research project on university language policy, which, I repeat, is only one of the research activities that will be developed inside this institutional project. The empirical results uh, that we may obtain can hopefully give an accurate idea of the language policy practices of the European universities on the ground and help us prepare and implement an internationalized signage strategy at our universities. We are no more national universities. We are building a true European campus of city universities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Sanchez de Raul. Uh, as I told you, it was an exciting and innovative topic, uh, which is not usually dealt in a, in a, how would I say, normal way uh, in the halls and the classes of academic life. So thank you again for your original contribution and excellent uh, conference. And I think we are now arriving to the end of the morning. Uh, I know that uh, once our stomach is uh, demanding, uh, then uh, the brain will just stop uh, listening. And this is why we are going to stop here. We are going to have our lunch. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you for your participation. And we, afterwards, we are going to continue with our sessions in the afternoon. Thank you again. <clears throat> in Fonseca, okay? Please. Bueno. Tú estabas preocupado que yo me iba a meter la cosa. Te has dejado. Ah.